Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to get started. Welcome to the AFL-CIO. Uh, as you know, this is a one in a series uh, of book signings. Uh, we bring in uh, interesting and relevant authors uh, so that we get a chance to hear from them and also you get a chance to, to talk with them. I'm really excited today, uh, and it is really my pleasure to introduce uh, my friend uh, and a longtime friend of the labor movement, Dick Ravitch. And, uh, Dick is here to discuss his memoir, So Much to Do. Uh, and let me tell you, that title is definitely an understatement when it comes to Dick's career. Uh, Dick's life in public service has been intertwined with the labor movement since the 1950s. Some of you here probably don't remember the 50s. Uh, uh, I barely do, I can tell you. <laughs> but I think that's just because I'm old right now. I'm starting to lose my memory. Uh, uh, I'm going to leave most of it to him uh, to tell you some stories, but I can't really resist mentioning a couple of moments in Dick's life uh, to give you a sense uh, of the type of life that this man has led. Uh, Dick's been involved in progressive politics since before most of us were born uh, in college working for Adelaide Stevenson. That was right after the Civil War. Uh, <laughs> and uh, during that campaign, he took Eleanor Roosevelt uh, to lunch. Now, that was a great day. You probably still remember that. I sure do. Uh, in 63, uh, Dick helped organize uh, the New York contingent uh, to the Great March for Jobs and Freedom. Uh, and in the course, formed a friendship with the March's organizer. Bayard Rustin, uh, a hero of the labor movement and the civil rights movement and the gay rights movement. And that friendship lasted uh, for the entire rest of uh, Bayard's life. In 75, uh, when New York City was on the verge of bankruptcy, Dick convened uh, a Chinese takeout summit with two of the New York City great labor leaders, Victor Gottbaum uh, and Al Shanker, uh, where the outlines of a, pen, a worker pension fund led rescue of the city was drawn up. People like to forget that it was uh, workers' money uh, that helped lead uh, New York out of bankruptcy, but we won't let them forget. I know you won't and I won't. Uh, and when the New York mayor, Ed Koch, attacked New York's transit workers for not working hard enough, uh, Dick was the head of the Metropolitan Transit Authority. And he went on TV to defend those workers. Quite frankly, Koch never got over it uh, and uh, was still attacking him uh, at the end of his life. And I guess that's really a case of being known by the quality of your enemies. Uh, starting in the 80s, Dick served as a key advisor to the labor movement on financial issues. He served on the board of the AFL-CIO's Housing Investment Trust for decades, never taking a, a single penny in compensation. Uh, and he remains one of the key people uh, that we at the AFL-CIO count on for financial wisdom. And Dick has been responsible uh, in one way or another for the construction of hundreds of thousands of units of affordable housing in New York and across the country, including some of the first racially integrated housing built right here in the District of Columbia. And of course, Dick served as Lieutenant Governor of New York from 2009-2010. But I want to say this about Dick. Uh, this really, I think, Dick means the most to me. Uh, the, first of all, Dick's a, a highly highly successful businessman. Uh, but he's been a ferocious advocate for the principle that people who have done well in our society must pay their fair share for the price of civilization. And even as we meet today, uh, Dick has been locked in a public battle with Governor Andrew Cuomo over whether it's a good idea to give more tax breaks and tax cuts to the rich. I'm sure uh, that kind of thing leads to some awkward moments uh, on the social circuit in Manhattan. Uh, but here at the House of Labor, 
quite frankly, we couldn't be more, friend, more proud of you, my friend and my brother, Dick Ravitch. Well, it's a thrill to be here. I thank you all for coming, and Rich, I thank you for, for inviting me. I, um, I have to begin by uh, saying a couple of things. I, I begin my book with a quote from Plato that says, if you're not prepared to engage in politics, you deserve to be governed by inferior people. And in many ways, this book, aside from telling a lot of stories that are, some of which are fun, it's really, if, if I had a purpose and a motive, it was to plead that young people recognize that the only way you change anything in a democracy is by getting involved in politics. You don't govern by being above politics. No particular person intended to be covered by that. Uh, number two, that um, that <clears throat> change only comes about through the political process, and it's essential that politics not be treated as it is in so many worlds as a dirty word. Some of our most distinguished newspapers use the word politics in a persistently pejorative way. And that creates a cultural atmosphere that discourages young people from getting in politics. Anyway, that's a large reason why I, I wrote this. Now I want to go back and tell you a few things. Um, and Rich, uh, as friends do for one another, uh, exaggerates. It wasn't hundreds of thousands. It was about 40,000 units of affordable housing in, here in Washington, primarily New York and Puerto Rico. Uh, and that was my business, and I was enjoying it very much, though I started my career here in Washington on the Hill when I first got out of law school in the Army, and I got a job uh, uh, by dating some of the secretaries in, on the, up on the Hill, and um, met a congressman from California who gave me a job, uh, which was a great experience. Then I got married, and I decided I had to make a few bucks and create some economic security and maybe come back into public life when I, I had a little more independence, and I lucked into this business, and it turned out fabulously. And, um, and then, uh, having grown up in a family that worshipped Roosevelt, I got involved in uh, the civil rights movement and came down to Washington in, in, in um, 63 and met, as Rich said, Bayard Rustin, uh, who became a very good friend. And through him, uh, my life in, in way changed in many ways. First of all, Bayard's office in New York was at the UFT headquarters on Park Avenue South. Um, and uh, that's how I met Al Shanker, who became a very close friend of mine for the remainder of his life. Uh, and um, uh, that's how I met Lane Kirkland, who asked me some years later to become chairman of the uh, AFL-CIO Housing Investment Trust. Uh, and Lane and his wife Irina were, became very good friends as well and were wonderful people. And I, I became exposed to to the world of, of labor leadership and came to realize that so many of the things that I cared about in this country and in this world were, were uh, dependent upon the effectiveness with which uh, the labor leadership was able to function in our democracy. And um, uh, now I'm going to tell you some stories about um, them. Uh, first of all, about a month or two after the Civil Rights March in 63, I got a call from Bayard Rustin asking me if I would have lunch with a Philip Randolph. And of course, I was, knew the name, uh, and I was thrilled with the idea, and we had lunch, and he told me that, Mr. Randolph told me that, you know, Dick, you know you're in the business, that a lot of the building trades in New York are still fully uh, segregated. 